Hey everyone, producer Dave here. Some of what you're gonna hear during this isn't gonna make a whole lot of sense. What was happening is some people were giving out t-shirts during our show. Uh, that's great, we're glad they do that and we appreciate the feature at Fourth Wall. But on audio, you, you have no idea what's going on. So I'm sorry about that, but I thought the content was good enough that it would be worth putting out anyway. Enjoy the show. I don't think we've done any Peter Thiel content. Um, Peter Thiel is very much kind of in line with these kind of IDW people. In fact, Eric Weinstein works for him. And so <clears throat> here's an interview from seven days ago with Peter Thiel. Apparently he's the leader of the rebel alliance. Uh, Peter Thiel is a very large part of why the world sucks right now. He, he is. Peter Thiel. He was one of the uh, Facebook angel investors. Italy, uncommon knowledge now. Oh my God. Is, could this be any more pretentious? <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Do you have any gray poupon? Like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Welcome like that guy's him. house has a golf cart. Common knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Peter Thiel graduated from Stanford and then from Stanford Law School. A few months after joining one of the most prestigious law firms in New York, he decided not to practice law, returned to California, and soon co-founded a tech startup. After selling that startup, PayPal, he became an investor, making the first outside investment in Facebook. Since then, he has invested in companies such as LinkedIn, Palantir and SpaceX. Peter Thiel has also become. I've worked for two of those companies. Peter, welcome. Peter, thanks for having me. Things so, Peter, that makes Peter Thiel your boss. In the last quarter century. I'm part of the problem. The United <laughs> States has slowed. Real wages have remained, for the most part, stagnant. Moore's law that computing power per dollar would effectively double 18, every 18 months hasn't applied for years. Instead, we've got a kind of parody of Moore's law, E. Room's law, which is more. More spelled backwards, that uh, every new bio, the price of a new biotech drug doubles every seven years, and in field after field, even theoretical progress seems to have slowed. Physics in the last 50 years, nothing like the enormous creativity of the first half of the 20th century. From Einstein's general relativity in 1916 to putting a man on the moon in 1969, just over half a century, the last time we put a man on the moon, Half a century ago, Peter Thiel, we were promised. But there's nothing on the moon. We've talked about this. What the? F there's nothing there. <laughs> Just a fucking rock. All we there's a whole lot of regolith there. there. What has happened? Well, I, th I think you just gave a very, a very good summary of what happened. That some somehow um, we, you know, we had. Uh, we had this sort of multifaceted, multidimensional progress in the first half of the 20th century, where if you define technology in the late 1960s, um, it would have meant rockets and aerospace and the green revolution in agriculture and, you know, and computers and new medicines and all sorts of things. Whereas uh, today, uh, maybe the last quarter century, the world technology um, is synonymous with information technology, which right. is that we've had some continued progress in this world of um, of bits, internet, computers, mobile internet, maybe even that slowed over the last decade or has at least become much less charismatic. Mm. Um, but uh, See, but I don't know if this is true, though, that they're saying uh, that, like, technological advances are slowing down. I don't think it's true. I just don't think that, like, you have the benefit of hindsight when you're looking at the first half of the 20th century and you can kind of compress it, right? Yeah. Whereas we're living yeah, in I don't the current time. At all where we're living in the current time and we're not able to compress the current time and, and like even maybe, maybe even see or know about all of the magnificent technological advances that are happening, you know? Yeah. Like uh, there's like AI right now is going through a, a huge, absolutely huge revolution. Like, you know, we have cars that can drive themselves. I can go to, I can go to Dolly too and just type in like, big titty goth girlfriend and i'll get a fucking picture of that right <clears throat> and the the other thing and somebody in chat brought it up is that like moore's law is it's we're reaching the limits of physics pretty much and that's why like the, the uh processor technology you're not getting super you know that's 
that's why they that's why instead of like <clears throat> that's why they started doing multi-core processors is because they started reaching like the limit of how much smaller they could make the the, the transistors or whatever in the processor <laughs> yeah and so like when you like like when you get down like you're not it doesn't mean technology stopped because this particular piece of technology is so mature that there's not a whole lot of room left in it. That just means that the innovation is happening elsewhere. Like you were saying, the innovation is happening yeah. in software with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning because, because but to be clear, the there's also, there's also massive innovation in hardware outside of processors. Like just look at flash memory, like yeah. flash memory used to be, it used to be incredibly slow. Like think back uh, like how flash memory was in like the the mid 90s like it was incredibly slow because it was brand new technology uh it was not memory dense at all like hard drives at the time were were way more dense than flash storage uh and right now hard drives are more dense than flash storage but you know, it, flash storage has caught up a lot to hard drives. You know, I could get like a, a eight terabyte flash storage thing about the size of a two and a half inch hard drive. Uh, Actually, you can get one. Admittedly, you can get it. you it's get way it. more expensive. But. You, get it. you can get an NVMe one that's the size of your middle finger. <laughs> yeah. But like that, that technology right now is going through... Uh, kind of uh like it's it's going through what processors were going through where like you know every couple years i can get double the capacity on the same size and for half the money you know yeah so like moore's law in number of transistors in a processor might not have kept up over the last few years but like in other areas you've got technological uh technological innovation coming at the same rate you know right and not not for nothing someone in the chat also mentioned that essentially a vaccine was developed in about a year like that's amazing mm -hmm. <laughs> that's going to be looked back upon as just a, a, a triumph of modern technology and <clears throat> you know yeah, like medical technology is is way more advanced than it was 20 years ago right and like like, but you were saying it's not just, um, not just storage, it's network technology too. the ability to transmit, transmit bits back and forth. Like, like there, it took forever, but we're rolling out fiber and fiber is like, yeah, they're giving you a gigabit, but you could get a hundred gigabits on the kind of fiber that they're installing. I mean, just look at like wireless communication back, back 20 years ago. Uh, I think it was like. Wi-Fi B, uh, you know, 802.11 B. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it it might have been 802.11 G, but I think it was still B. And that the data rate on that was like what, f like 500 kilobits per second or something. I, it was it was slow. I remember G was a a big leap forward, and it was like barely over a meg a second or something. It right. It wasn't fast, and now you've got you know, gigabit Wi-Fi. Right. Most people like the only people that really like back in the day, it was always better to hardwire. And now like most people don't need network cables in their home. You and I need, you know, I no. need them, but that's more about latency and reliability. That's not about like just raw throughput. And, and to be clear, you could get a Wi-Fi system that has, just as good latency as and throughput as a as a wired connection but that kind of hardware is like enterprise class hardware and you're not going to buy that when a network cable is a thousand times cheaper like literally like 20 bucks for 50 feet of cat six dude yeah yeah <laughs> and good cat six too you get one for 15 bucks if you don't care if it frays or whatever and it's <laughs> but you think about like like think about what just what like a network card that you put in your computer can do now because of the, yeah. the advance in uh, process, uh, basically processor power. And you, you know, you think about like what, like what's going on on processors for mobile devices, like arm, like arm is arm is just so far ahead of where it once was. Um, you think about like the ability, like 
the different G's, everybody's afraid of 5G, right? But you think about like your cell phone and how much data it can transfer now versus ten, even just 10 years ago. Yeah, and think about how much computing you can do on your cell phone now. Like I can I could technically do my job on a cell phone. It would be incredibly annoying, but I could technically do my job on a cell phone. Uh, yeah. But a lot of people's jobs perfectly adapt to a cell phone, you know? A social media manager, they can do most of their job on a cell phone. And the other thing is like uh CPU technology is sort of not stalled i mean it's just getting cheaper and better more reliable <clears throat> able to get a little better clocks out of it uh, they're still they're able to do more with less power but then you look at like gpu technology and that's still going gangbusters and just getting faster and mm -hmm. faster and you know supply chain issues uh, notwithstanding if that you just took that out of the equation you know when gpus got really expensive because of supply chain issues in crypto mining that's probably a, another place where maybe Moore's law is applying. You know what I'm saying? It's it, there. It's funny because yeah. it's, the, you know, they've, it's just, it's just interesting. It's like, the, like, well, the way they're talking about it is kind of dumb, actually. Like what do you, what he just said is kind of dumb. Yeah. I don't, I really am like struggling to think what he means here like in what way is technology not advancing faster than it was in the the first half of the 20th century yeah like somebody in chat says the nvidia 4080 is 60 percent faster than the 3080 like that's that's huge <laughs> right that is a huge that is a huge leap in 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 power just you know it also it does take a lot more power to do that but right. Yeah, more, but even more, at the same power level, it's still way faster. But he, but like you know, and for more for like regular people, that the the GPU like that we got, it was sort of still influenced by the supply chain. It was maybe ten percent more than it should have been. It was like four hundred dollars, and it smokes the fucking four hundred dollar GPU from a few years ago I had in the computer before, right? Like, just <laughs> absolutely smokes it. And like, uh, like you were saying with, uh or like you and I were both saying with software, you think about how software works now versus how it worked like 20 years ago. Software is so much more reliable now than 20 years ago. Like how often can you remember your computer just crashing, just a hard crash. You got to turn it all the way off, you know, hold the, the power button to turn it off. Um, the last time that happened, it was, um, what we call an io error or a pebcac <laughs> you know what i'm saying problem exists between a uh, keyboard and chair <laughs> but what i mean is like you know the software has become so much at least like operating systems have become so much more reliable in the past 20 years like the the technology that goes into an operating system has advanced incredibly in the last 20 years you know, operating systems 20 years ago were like Bad. like a speak and spell in comparison. And not for nothing, I think the more reliable hardware is probably, you know, part of the equation too. Like, you know what I mean? Better better quality control on things like memory chips, that kind of stuff. You know, it's it's all these different things that are coming together. So and it's just that as a technology, any technology matures, it's not going to seem it's not going to seem as amazing anymore. It's just the way it is. Like, yeah. like when the internal combustion engine came out, it was amazing. And then it was an iterative process. And now it's so much, it's matured to the point where it's time to replace it in a lot of, you know, for like most people's <laughs> automobiles. Right. Yep. And so I, like, I don't understand like <sighs> generalized sense of stagnation. It's always, uh, it's always quite a complicated thing to talk about because you have to sort of evaluate all these different things. So, you know, how do you weight um, um, the smoothness of your iPhone versus the lack of a flying car? Right. How do you sort of... How do you no, sort no, of no, 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 hold on. Pause, <laughs> pause here real quick. We have flying cars. We have had flying cars forever. They're called helicopters. Right, or... The reason not everyone drives around in a flying car is because you don't fucking want people flying without intense training. Right? Like, 
like if you're in a flying car, your fender bender is now potentially deadly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, oops, I fell asleep at the wheel and crashed into the top of my neighbor's house. <laughs> right. Like drunk driving becomes a whole different scenario if your car flies, <laughs> right? <laughs> Like this is this yeah. We have flying cars. The reason we don't use them as cars is because you need a fucking pilot's license to use them. <laughs> Things. Uh, I think the difficulty of quantifying it is one of the reasons that we have not talked about it. Oh, and also like just energy consumption. It takes energy to get the car up, so you're <laughs> using a lot more energy to travel the same distance. Unless you're moving multiple people. Yes, of course. Well, that's an airplane. Yeah. And this is taking us so long to figure out that uh, we've actually been been stuck. That, <clears throat> that you know, we think we've been in, in enchanted uh, a forest, but we've been wandering the desert for 40 or 50 years so, or something like that. So since you raise it, how do you handle the counter argument, which is, which is perfectly straightforward? Look, progress takes place in fits and starts. It's not smooth and continuous in every field. It jumps around. And we have had a communications revolution, which in, in this period of time, we've gone, well, we didn't get flying cars, but we did get Dick Tracy watches. We did get iPhones. We have got an internet, which- Oh, look at the Hoover Institute guy being like, dude, what are you talking about? Picture. That's the counter argument. <laughs> well, uh, well, again, I, th I think the, the challenge is to somehow try to quantify over all these things. How, how, how big are they? How significant they are, are they? And I would say on the level of the politics, the culture, the math. You can't do that when you're living through it, though. Profound and like, I'm sorry, but is it wasn't packet switching like a revolutionary fucking technology that happened in the last 50 years? Uh, packet switching happened in the 60s, oh. didn't it? I, I, Late 60s? Maybe. Okay, Could have so been maybe, the 70s. May, okay, so maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. But like. Just like about uh, 50 years ago. Think about like how TCP IP changed the world. I mean, these people are just like, mm -hmm. they're like, they're just like you said, World like Wide we Web was 1991. Right. And it's like, like we both said, it's you, you you're not going to notice it as you're living through it as much as you'll be able to notice it as much as you'll be able to notice it in hindsight. Yeah. And the World Wide Web absolutely changed the world. Like, arguably, that is the most important invention of the last 50 years. Because you think about it, how often do you use a web browser? It's like, it's like, so your web browser is basically an operating system within your operating system at this point. That's how important it, that the web is. Yeah. Like, your web browser is the single most important piece of software on your computer, on your phone, on whatever, and you use it every single day. Well, that's just because you don't have Grindr. <laughs> there is not a single day that you do not use your web browser or at least web technologies right like http this is this is amazing this is amazing encryption has come very far like the just the just just off the top of my head like just computer technology is just like think about like what your computer was like remember a 486 <laughs> I never personally owned a 486. My first processor was a Motorola 68K. And you know what? That was an awesome processor. I had an Amiga. It's that the younger generation will not do, do better than their parents. There's some kind of generational compact that's, that's been broken. We still have progressivism in politics. We still have it as a word, but uh, it's sort of, we don't have it in anything else in our society. And, uh, and then I know there's progressive house music, sir. Progressive metal. <laughs> we use the word progressive in a lot of ways in the arts. But it's progressive insurance. Yeah. yeah. yeah that's right. <laughs> this, this guy's not, this guy's probably not too in tune with the arts, I'm guessing. <laughs> you know, I think the computer uh, internet revolution was the one, one big exception. And it is striking how, um, how uncharismatic that has become over the last uh, six or seven years. Uncharismatic. It's well, like, like what does he hold mean? on what what do you mean the computer revolution was the one big exception the internet slash computer revolution was the one big exception like does he think the internet is the only thing like if looking back looking back 50 years would you say that it's just the internet 
that's like everything falls under the internet like, like smartphones. Does think, that just fall under the internet? I mean, the the the, the smartphone would be sh- fucking shit without the internet. Remember when Apple tried to put out the Newton? <laughs> yep. Like PDAs were yeah, shit. Yeah, I remember PDAs. Yeah, they were kind of shit, right? But yep. <laughs> like, just think about like when you go buy a new refrigerator, what the refrigerator's like versus 50 years ago. Like the power consumption, the... It's, it's a, just an overall efficiency, the use of space inside, the ability... like. Some of them are connected to the, like, come on. Like, I mean, really, we're, we're, we're being unrealistic here. All of this falls under electricity. So there hasn't really been a, a real innovation since electricity. Did you know there were electricity <laughs> truthers? <laughs> so I think he's given the, the 20th century too much credit. It's all about the 19th century. I don't think there's actually been. I don't think there's actually been a real innovation since fire because how did we make electricity for most of the, the, our history with fire? <laughs> there you go. Even in San Francisco or Silicon Valley, um, the felt sense is that uh, most people are somehow being, being left behind, that it is not, it's not this utopian inclusive future at all. But that's, that's um, the, that's the future you created, Peter Thiel. <laughs> That's your fault, you asshole. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, he, he created it on purpose. <laughs> right, because he was like, I'm not rich enough. And then he got real <laughs> mad at Gawker. Uh, that was weird. I'd like to do uh, I'd like to do an intellectual dollar tree about um the takedown of Gawker. I just don't know how to do it. Like I don't I don't we'd have to it'd be more like a video essay kind of thing, I guess, but like that's a story. Hmm. We that, should do that on how the tech are you? Oh yeah, yeah, like a bonus, like a special thing. Yeah, yeah, because um, it was so funny. Like, like in two thousand seven, Valleywag put out a thing that was like Peter Thiel is totally gay. Everyone, and they the point of the article was that he was donating to anti gay politicians, and everybody who was like working in tech, this valley was like a smaller place for a long time, right? Any gay dude working in tech who was a little younger than Peter Thiel remembers peter teal trying to maybe take them home <laughs> so it was like oh mm. you sure got the scoop here valley wag good job it's like thanks for telling us what we all already know but <laughs> then he decided to take down fucking gawker because of that he bankrolled hulk hogan is just such a what a petty petty man what a petty man aren't they all fucking he's one of the people that when kara swisher says about them that you're so poor all you have is money <laughs> she means you have no integrity, you have no self-respect, yeah. you have, you know, you have none of these other things that make people wonder, make people great and improve, enrich people's lives. Oh, you, the only yep. thing that enriches your life is that you're rich. Yep. Uh, he's a lot like, uh, the elongated muskrat guy. Yep. Yep. Sort of the same. Shocker that they hate each other. Um, <laughs> we should be every day, wake up in the morning and I don't know, thank God or whatever you believe in that Peter Thiel and Elon Musk hate each other because the dystopia we would be living in right now, if they didn't, would be much worse. Again, I'm quoting you. This is something you mentioned just the other day. There's a sense that science and tech are a trap that humanity is setting for itself. Well, there's always a question, you know, why why the slowdown has right. happened, and uh, what slowdown? I, I had that same sense about agriculture. These things are so so overdetermined, and it can be things from sclerosis and overregulation in government to uh, to you know ways of education institutions have deranged. I think we should go it's back to a nomadic culture. It's become harder to to discover new things. Where you know, even if we build new particle colliders in physics, how many new particles are we finding? And so, um, so this sort of our how many particles? That's not what physics is. What do you we get? We found physics? one in 2012. You get to, this is what happens when the only physicist you know is Eric Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> like we we literally found there's only like there's only like 15 of them, and we found a new one in 2012. Right? Like get, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Components. We're not finding new particles. But Maybe there aren't to, that many. You know, if I had to anchor on a single narrative, the one. The one that I've come to believe very strongly is that there's something about uh, science and technology that is uh, very dangerous, that, that feels somewhat like a trap, where, um, where so many of these uh, technologies um, have sort of a very dark, violent, 
even apocalyptic dimension. The paradigmatic example are probably nuclear weapons where, you know, it didn't, progress didn't stop immediately. Their chairs have penises for arms. It was some kind of a delayed it's in Peter Thiel's writer. reaction where, say, in 1970, people woke up one day and realized, you know, we can blow the whole, whole world up, you know, 20 times over. You know, we're sending people to the moon to build these ICBMs. See what I mean? Yep. Nuclear, thermonuclear bombs to the Soviet Union. And like I said, it's in the contract. When you interview Peter Thiel, you have to have, like, dick arms on your chair. <laughs> At some point. <laughs> I'm the only one on Twitch, Twitch allowed to say that, by the way. <laughs> what happened with nuclear technology is true of so many other areas. Um, you know, uh, there's a question about AI. Is this, is this is a fundamentally dangerous apocalyptic technology? Well, not for nothing. This guy is sitting here. He's the head of Palantir. And Palantir is a terrifying entity. <sighs> mm. There's a left-wing version of this with climate change, but maybe you can generalize this to various other forms of environmental degradation. Didn't he just uh, say is, um, that, like, yeah. there was no more technological innovation, that, like, we've slowed down a lot? And now he's saying, like, we got to hold it on the AI. That's moving too fast. That's going to destroy us. We got to chill on that. I'm not sure that's what he's saying. I think he's saying that there is a panic around it, but I, I fucking... I don't know for sure. That's one of the things I've watched this guy talk a lot. And it's, he's pretty good at sounding like he's saying something, but not saying much of anything. Hmm. You no, know, um, you know, I, I polemically, I've often suggested, you know, we should have a ticker tape parade for the scientists who invented the MRNA vaccine. So we're going to, um, you know, an impressive breakthrough in biotech. And I think we're uncomfortable giving them a ticker tape parade because because it's because you think it's Robert Malone adjacent to the mRNA vaccine is um, we're immediately reminded as we have that ticker tape parade or if we were to have it of uh, the sort of gain of function research that was being conducted at the Wuhan lab and which is sort of this Orwellian word maybe for uh, for a bioweapons program. And so so all these things are are deeply so, adjacent. So the notion is that every one of these technological and scientific advances Oh, look, you can tell he's thinking really hard. Look at him. You know how David Fuller does this when he's thinking? <laughs> this guy, like, closes his eyes real tight. <laughs> he's being thoughtful right now. We got people posting essays in the chat. It's fine. I ignore that shit. This is one, of the <laughs> one of the consequences of our, uh, I would call it rapid growth, but I would say steady growth. Is There's going to be some... Uh, going to be some going to be some people that want to want to use our channel like a soapbox. And that's all right. I, I I read kind of skimmed over what that person was saying. That's fine. They're not they're not they're not posting the 14 words or anything. So we're we're good. <laughs> to be so thrilled about. Every one of them has is a double-edged sword. It at least it at least has a it, it's at least double-edged. Now, you know, I it doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing them. I I'm that's still right. I'm still on the, you know, I'm still on the accelerationist camp. I'm still on the deregulation side. I'm still, uh, I, I, I still think it's a catastrophe that these things have, have slowed down. But, um, but it's not simply a failure. It's also, you know, it's also, uh, it's also what, uh, what people have done because, you know, the alternatives were, were, were quite, quite dangerous and quite frightening. I would like there to be all, you know, we've made very little progress. I feel like, research. I'd like to the extent more. that he is right, that there is a lack of innovation, it's not because of deregulation, it's because of monopolies. Like, there's a lack of innovation in social media, sure. But that's because it's dominated by two companies. Right. I, I, you used to be able to argue it was three because I mean Google Plus was brilliant, but <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, well, Google, it's it's Google, kind of becoming three, but the other one is literally propped up by the Chinese government. So, <laughs> uh, the TikTok is profitable, to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, but they didn't get there without money from the Chinese government. Yeah, sure. I don't know. I like TikTok. I have one hundred and forty something followers on there. I'm baller. <laughs> I'm probably gonna have more followers on uh, Port 87 soon than I have on TikTok. Oh yeah, follow us on Mastodon Port 87 dot social. That's, That's our right. Mastodon instance. Uh, if you want to join that one, you can. If not, follow us H Parent at Mastodon or H Parent at Port 87 dot social. And then Dave, what's yours? Dave at Port 87 dot social. There you go. Progress in in biotech. 
but maybe if we'd had a lot of progress, there would have been some dangers with that, and people were very, very scared of those dangers. So the you know, there's a there's a there's a nuclear power plant deb- debate in Germany. You know, why did they shut down the nuclear power plants? It's, it's the dumbest thing ever. But but so many of these nuclear power plants, you know, are dual use. You know, you you, you create plutonium, and then you can build you can build bombs, and it's. It's not that easy to separate the civilian from military uses. Right. So the idea here... But that wasn't the concern in Germany. In Germany, they tried to go to other forms of electricity before it was feasible. Nobody's over here telling Germany they can't have a nuke. Like, what is this guy talking about? They stopped the presses. The fucking European state of Germany might build a nuke. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, they have nukes, you idiot. (laughs) We've slowed down for all kinds of little reasons that we can see, increase in regulation, this, that, fine. But there's a deep reason, almost at the level of the, the reptile brain, something so deep that we don't often talk about. But you guys haven't established that we have slowed down. I think you and me did a pretty good job of talking about ways in which, and mind you, our, our ability to think about this is just incredibly limited because we're living through it. And we, we made a pretty good counter argument. About. Yeah, that we certainly, technologically speaking, we have not slowed down. In fact, we have technology now that is creating technology without our help. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean that's an oversimplification, and like I'm sure that like a mach- like a machine learning expert would smack me with a fish or something for saying that. But like we, <laughs> but we have we have tech we have literally tech we have software that can write software. Yep. Uh, it can also copy software. Yeah, it can, uh, it can spit out copies of exact code. And then, you know, is that, does that code fall under the license of what it was originally written by? Or is it written by the AI? Does the AI get to pick a new license for it? That's some questions that really need to be answered. Right. But like, I think this is almost like it's it's interesting that that we talked about uh, Shermer's sort of antiquated view of how a conspiracism works, and here we are talking about what I think is Peter Thiel's sort of antiquated view of how technology, like how technology marches forward. It seems like he's not. <clears throat> it seems like he's not living in the present time. It's weird. Mm-hmm. I think you should write us a check. <laughs> Conscious of it. Tech and science is frightening. So if we you, if you look just at, as happy to have it slow down. If you look watch this, are either of them, look, look, first of all, it's creepy how exactly the same the level of their water glasses are. Um, I'm, I don't know. Is that maybe in Peter Thiel's contract? There must be exactly this many milliliters of water in this kind of glass or. And you're not allowed to touch it. <laughs> you're not allowed to drink it. And also it occurs to me that the guy on the right is like, um, like more reasonable seeming and slightly trimmer Glenn Beck. Uh, you know, I used to, as a, <laughs> as a teenager, I used to love science fiction. I haven't read much science fiction in, in decades because it's, it's all just dystopian and depressing. Yeah. And maybe Well, how a, would you know that if you haven't fucking read it? <laughs> it's fucking But like science science fiction, like the best science fiction stories are a mixture of dystopia and utopia. Star Trek is a mixture of utopian and dystopian science fiction. Yep. Uh The Martian, one of my my favorite book and one of my favorite movies uh is neither it's neither utopian nor dystopian it's like man versus environment story eternal gambler what the fuck what what happened to you over on another channel you should make you should make whoever that is watch this peter teal video but you got banned so somebody else should go over there and make the, whoever that is watch the peter teal video eternal gambler <laughs> You're you're weird. You you should follow this channel. You'll like it here. Except that your account's <laughs> pretty new, but you're weird. You'll like it here. This is this this weird left twitch. So some reflection of of our culture, but uh, maybe it is also oh, thanks. telling thanks us for the something about, um, about the logic of um, 
of science and technology that uh, that so many of the paths to the future are um, are extremely dangerous. You know, if you had a if you had a warp drive like they have in Star Trek, you know, um, could you send weapons at warp speed and then they would hit you faster than the speed of light and you would you wouldn't even see them before they they hit you. Yes. And, uh, and so there are all these sort of plot holes in well, the original Star Trek universe. Maybe. But is you like saying there's plot holes in the Star Trek universe? Yeah. It's a work of fiction designed to entertain. They t they went to great lengths to make it, most of it plausible based on what we know about the world. But yeah, there's going to be plot holes. It's a fiction. <laughs> yeah. So like the weapon would need a warp drive and the weapon. I mean, can something that is traveling at warp collide with something that is not traveling at warp? I think that depends on which type of warp drive you're you're talking about, the original series type of warp drive or the next generation type of warp drive. I just like this is just this is like why are you picking you know why he doesn't like Star Trek is because it's fucking communism. That's why he doesn't like Star Trek. He doesn't give a shit about the warp drive. What he doesn't like is that what he's like, what do you mean nobody is hungry? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean there's no homeless people in San Francisco for me to yell at? <laughs> like, <laughs> Over time, people figured out. Um, we'll come back to that. China. The late foreign policy analyst Henry Rowan, writing in 1996, that year is important, 1996, quote, when will China become a democracy? The answer is around the year 2015. This prediction is based on China's steady and impressive economic growth, which in turn fits the pattern of the way in which freedom has grown in Asia and elsewhere in the world, close quote. He didn't even, did you see he added his own words to that quote? Watch this. Here we go. When will China become a democracy? The answer is around the year 2015. This prediction is based on China's steady and impressive economic growth, which in turn fits the pattern of the way in which freedom has grown in Asia and elsewhere in the world. Close quote. Why can't you just read the quote? Yeah, he added his, he added his own words. He didn't really change the meaning, but that was weird. That is weird. And also, like... <clears throat> The, the problem with that statement was the suggestion that um, opening economic markets would necessarily lead to more freedom for the individual. And that's a, that's a stupid, like, well, there's no evidence for that assumption. Yeah. First economic growth, then democracy. Not a crazy suggestion. It worked in South Korea, and then it worked in Taiwan. But of course, the prediction that China would become a democracy in 2015 today looks preposterous. If you could imagine this, predicting the future is hard. Not everybody <laughs> can predict that Deanna Plas is going to get gassed at the Capitol. All right. Listen, not everybody knows the future. I know the future. But about like meaningless <laughs> things about fucking wackadoodles. That's it. I can predict Madison Star Moon's behavior and that's not useful in any meaningful way, but it's fun. <laughs> i'm gonna predict that in the next two years there will be a revolution in email and email will become much more pleasant to use i mean i sure hope so i'd like i'd like you to i'd like you to hire me and fucking give me more money than i deserve <laughs> you know it's it's uh it's again why questions are always 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 hard hard to to answer it's uh you know the that guy drank some of his water have on china was that uh is peter Thiel gonna drink <laughs> the peter exact same gets up and walks out it, no he's gonna I drink told you not to drink the water he's gonna drink the exact same amount of water down to the milliliter so their glasses are exactly <laughs> the same level <laughs> this is the kind of hard-hitting analysis that you come here for everybody <laughs> the wall in 1989 and they were, they were going to have um perestroika without glasnost they were gonna by the way you'd think with all of his money he could get a good haircut a, sort of a free and open society um, i don't i don't think there's anything wrong with his haircut as a person whose hair is falling out i'd take peter peter teal's haircut well before 2015 that it wasn't quite trending that way you know you had a you had a great it's a bit of a bowl cut in china where the big i, mean, I guess a bowl cut is a look didn't have any effect listen he's got a floby presence in china i just think that look is out of style 2000 it was, you know, it was, it was pretty, 
pretty effectively walled off. And, uh, and you know, if you ask people in Silicon Valley circa 2005 or 2010, there was still some Fukuyama inevitability law that you know, China would have to open up to the U.S. tech companies. It wasn't obvious why that was true. Even in 2000, oh, China has opened to the U.S. tech companies, just not in the way that you, that one would have predicted. They are making all of the products. <laughs> like, that's pretty open, if you ask me. They're like, oh yeah, we'll take your money. <laughs> like, it just depends how you think about it. Like, is China freer than it was back when the prediction was made? I don't fucking know. For or 2010. How do you but, quantify you know, freedom? I think, um, I th- is I think it in freedom units? We were, mm-hmm. Okay. Freedom is when you sue. A, things freedom things is when you sue a gossip so rag out of um, out of existence. Say that there's something <laughs> you know unusually crazy about G. That it, right. he's the but then the, isn't the gossip Stalin rag James not Conn free? Or it has negative freedom units now. Thing like this, um, and then there's maybe so you gain maybe freedom maybe units by taking others' freedom units away. Zero sum game. Could be that's the American way. Free not completely totalitarian as long as the economy was growing 8% a year. And at the point when that slowed down and all exponential things eventually slow, you had to actually clamp down a lot more. <clears throat> that once China grows at 3 or 4% a year and the growth is uneven, um, it's, it's actually going to become more authoritarian, more totalitarian, some, something like that. Let, let me try two quotations on you here. The historian Stephen Kotkin, whom you know, when asked to name his main finding after a lifetime of studying in the Soviet archives, quote, they were communists, close quote. President Xi Jinping of China, this is, he's speaking to the central... You're right, he's doing it right now. This is a speech the Chinese republished in... Oh my God, they're the same level. It's a little less. No, it's a little less. I don't don't know. The camera angle's a little weird, too. I think Teal still has more. He needs to drink a little more. (laughs) The interview's over. (laughs) <laughs> far back, you know, failed the internet american analysts discovered in 2020 xi jinping in 2013 to the central committee there are people who believe that communism is an unattainable hope but facts have repeatedly told us that marx and engels analysis is not outdated capitalism is bound to die out close quote so in the conflict with china to what extent are we facing just i mean capitalism conflict? does suck but this is so you know them body language hucksters? You know those people that are like yeah. body language experts? According to the body language expert, this guy is probably cheating on his wife because he keeps messing with his fucking wedding ring. But I don't believe that shit. That's like fucking horoscopes for fucking people who don't like horoscopes. <laughs> it was always the question with the Soviet <laughs> Union, right? Oh, it's just another great... No, it isn't. They're different because they're communists. Same question for China. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that, that uh, we, we need to take it more seriously at face value. Where right. They say they're communists. We should just... Take that very argue argument. with them. we should we should take that at, at least at, at face value uh, there probably are a lot of sub questions one can ask so maybe they're not strictly marked oh my god i just realized freedom minus. units and so it is sort of should be called fu's structure yeah, fuck um, you elements of it that are also <laughs> fascist where you know the the prog spring was communism with the human oh my god geeko made a clip called that said it's like uh, hp points like with the water glass <laughs> China is fascism with a a communist face or something like that. Um, And then, of course, there are some. Oh, the interviewer is drinking more. It's it's also different from fascism. The Hoover Institute guy. Early 20th century. Uh, Sorry, the Hoover vacuum guy. Were fundamentally youth movements. uh, um, uh, And uh, and then China is kind of a gerontocracy. Now he's got a lot less. It is is distinctive. I don't know. It's sort of a half fascist, half communist gerontocracy. Uh, it is, um, you know, it is, it is, it is strange. It's strangely much less idealistic or ideological, I think, than the Soviet Union. It, 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 it strikes me that people probably don't really like. Why would I take this guy's Turkey. opinion on capitalism or communism seriously at all? Like, doesn't he have a whole lot of skin in the game? Yes, he certainly does. So, like, why would his opinion be at all unbiased? Because he's rich. That's what the chat says. <laughs> and I mean, he's rich. Yeah, exactly. He's super fucking wealthy. <clears throat> so, like, he's clearly going to have a bias. He's going to be like, oh, capitalism, best system ever, right? Also, great haircut. <laughs> down in a, in a very strange super cuts. way. 
So there are, there's certainly You're never too rich to go to supercuts and and different, <laughs> but, uh, but yet t- taking it as a communist country at face value, we could, we could do much worse than that. All right. Grand strategy. Since at least the Civil War, the United States. You know what? It, is that uncut knowledge? Because that's I mean, you know, whatever. I think it's unc now ledge. During the Second World War, we, we produced thousands of planes and tanks and ships. Peter's trying to catch up. And Oakland was producing a ship a day. Peter is definitely going to have to have to work harder to catch up. Produce them. We can't outspend them. <laughs> we should announce this like Our it's a race. Goes the argument <laughs> is to out innovate them. I've even heard the historian Andrew Roberts say that the future of civilization will is be there an empty fish world. tank behind him with a cloud in it. I think it's a sculpture, but like a sculpture of a cloud. So I, I think it is a cloud, but it's like, you know, on display. Also, there's a giant painting of the Last Supper above it. Yes. Not a good one either, I don't think. I'm going to need a table for 26. But there are only 13 of you, sir. So, on the one hand, in the coming conflict with China, we need innovation, goes at least one argument that I find compelling. But we ourselves, to some extent, as you just were suggesting, have locked down innovation. This is a serious pickle. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I ordered the Last Supper on Wish and and got this fucking painting (laughs) instead. You know, chat you stuff get your like room decor from Wish. Stuff like that is you. You all in chat. It's all your fault that the very smart people club on Twitter that I accidentally got myself involved in to raise the awareness of my podcast um, doesn't take us very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> all the very academic people who go after the IDW are like, "Oh, not these guys," and it's because of you. It's because we laugh at your hilarious jokes. <laughs> so this is mostly this is your fault. I hope you're proud of yourselves <laughs> uh i'm sure they are i would be proud of myself i i mean i think there's sort of our, that was a, a fantastic of, joke. a lot of different ways one can one can describe it if, if you i worry that if you frame it simply as a conflict between the united states and china uh, that is almost self-defeating where well because um, there's not much conflict between the united states and china <clears throat> Like, there are disagreements as nations will have, but we live in peace with the nation of China as well we need to because they build our iPhones. Like, what choice does... Like, we give the money for the iPhones that they build and they build the iPhones. What choice does anyone have in the matter? Like, you gotta live in peace. (sighs) Yep, here it is. The Wish.com Last Supper. Um, probably well, you can get it on wish it's four times the population <laughs> yep. so we have to we'd have to really like, great, blow that up and put it on my wall and they would we have to really block <laughs> them from stealing any of our innovations to to win a conflict where it's that lopsided four to one on on right. population um probably you know probably look here it is a in a display photo with the wrong aspect, aspect ratio so how does the strategic map <laughs> of the world shape up and uh you know do um you know Maybe China can beat the U.S., but it probably can't beat beat the whole world. And there is sort of a question whether whether. Um, but if we went to if World War Three you know, happened between the United States and China, there are nations that would ally with China. Yes, uh, most most notably, probably Russia. Yes, um, the communism in China, which is you know, it's, it's very. It's 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 nationalistic. It's 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 a it's a it socialism. Allies. It's a socialism of a nationalistic sort. Right. And uh, do, do you just does he mean national socialism? <laughs> oh no, he just called them Nazis. Ooh. Uh, so wait, communists are Nazis? Is that what he's saying? And there's something about that where uh, I don't think they'll be able to beat the whole world. Right, but that's, okay, so, that's absurd. If the United States got into an armed conflict with China, there are nations that would go, join on China's side. Yes. 
Yeah, that would be really bad for everyone. So in right, the and we, of the we conflict, after the to identify after as the after the war was over, there'd be nobody to comment on it. Sorry, China is the enemy, but it's not just the United States. Um, we, we really have maybe Switzerland in terms of the West, or in terms of no, fallout. Many allies fallout. As we can stitch together. What, are, yeah, yeah, what how do you describe mountains? They're, don't stop fallout. I don't. Think. Yeah, they're both unilateral and multilateral moves. I think the uh, Trump administration was correct that you had to try to do things unilaterally because the multilateral approaches were too slow. I think the uh, the Biden administration is correct that at some point, you know, you also have to try to do things more multilaterally. Uh, but I think there is there is some kind of a... There so is we need to do things walk. unilaterally in a multilateral way. Uh, if, if you look at the... Got it. The, um, Fucking the genius right here. Conflict ...with Russia, uh, there's obviously was this incredible mistake that Western Europe made. Yo, I need to refill my drink too. So have fun watching Peter Thiel. With Russia, um, you know, with, with the pipelines, with the denuclearization in Germany. And, uh, and, then, and then the question you have to ask is, aren't we, aren't we just too entangled with China in the entire Western world? I, I, I believe in free trade. I, I'm not in favor of tariffs, but uh, I, I would make an exception for, you know, our one massive geopolitical and ideological rival. All right. Um, our home state, California. Your home state. Your In favor of free trade, but now. not if it means resource curse. free trade I mean, with someone Here's the resource he curse. doesn't The resource curse like. is the phenomenon of countries with an abundance of natural resources, such as fossil fuels. That would be restricted trade. Country. And I would suggest to you that as soon as, like, if you're against free trade with your largest trading partner, you're... You're not for free trade. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're pretty, pretty decidedly not for free trade. And this guy's money comes from tech. Like he didn't invest in a lot of hardware stuff, right? He's mostly on the software side, but the hardware needed to run all the software stuff that that he's talking about is all built in China. So this guy's this guy's whole like his his whole thing is built on fucking electronics that are produced in China. Yep. What the fuck? Well, yeah, man, you got me. I um, don't know. Move on, Jenkins. Yeah, China is not like perfect Marxism, but like the United States isn't like perfect capitalism either. It's act, it's as if it's as if societies and countries are complicated. <laughs> you can't just slap nope. a word on them and be like, "This baby holds the most communism." Like, <laughs> go pour <laughs> another drink. Uh, oh, I already got my drink. Oh shit. Uh, I would Less say. Pure communism is probably just as bad as pure capitalism. And I think it's like completely unattainable. Like, you know what I'm saying? I think that both yeah. are, they're, they're completely unattainable. So it's like almost not even worth talking about it. Well, you know, we are the, you know what? Uh, that dude, Zoot, everybody was saying when we, when they got here, all the communists that came here, they're like, these shit libs are all right. K Dave and K Dave and HK are our favorite shit libs, and I, I I'm I I'm proud that I'm proud that communists say that you know what actually K Dave and HK are okay they're okay they're they're good shit libs, <laughs> and also like we've never tried pure capitalism or pure communism so I mean to that extent we don't know but I feel like we've never tried it because it's extremely obvious that it wouldn't work. Right, just ideological purity more generally is probably impossible to attain in a in a place with more than like fifty people. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't mean to like, yeah, I think it's like it's, I don't know if it's a good idea or a bad idea, but I know when you got like a lot of people, you're never going to get any kind of ideological pure, ideologically pure society because there's all these different fucking people in the fucking place, and they are all going to have all these different ideas and shit, and it's going to be a push pull between a bunch of different people who believe different things. Only obvious to your propagandized mind. I love, I love the fucking communists <laughs> who hang out here. They're fucking funny. I'm not a communist, but I'm not mad at communists. Y'all are okay. Y'all have better jokes. And I heard that communists redistribute ass. And Jordan Peterson should be all on board with that. But 
uh, my understanding is that communists are for like a like a consensual redistribution of ass whereas jordan peterson is for like an enforced redistribution of ass <laughs> all right that dude zoot i will tell you this if i had to pick one pure capitalism or pure communism to live under i would live under pure communism hands down right we take our chances on that absolutely yep because pure capitalism i mean it we've already had it it's feudalism right um not really uh pure capitalism would be like facebook having their own army uh it would just be like everything is transactional you know like every every single thing so like you know there wouldn't be roads because like who's going to pay for the roads like the only people that are going to pay for the roads are like stores to get you from there to the store right. so like and there so would be no honest. road to the library because the library wouldn't exist there <laughs> would only be a road to walmart not only that they'd only build a road from your house to the store if you were rich right? <laughs> like and like other stores wouldn't exist it would just be walmart so like you could either leave your house and go to the walmart or stay in your, your house. house excuse me that house would be owned by whoever <laughs> yeah. has the most money actually you could either leave your pod dwelling and go to the walmart <laughs> and i mean the other side of it is which like, is where you work anyway so you might as well go there the other side is communism where like you don't own your house but it doesn't matter because fucking everybody has a house <laughs> they just don't own it because like we don't think of it that way right like yeah and like yeah you like the likelihood is you would do better. You personally would do better under pure communism than pure capitalism. I, I would suggest to you that this is uh this is all kind of shit and masturbation though, because I don't think that the, this ideological purity that you talk about even fucking exists. You know what I'm saying? I agree. Like, it doesn't, but like in this, in this fanciful world where these things are allowed to exist, like you yourself would do better under pure communism than pure capitalism statistically. I think because so. like statistically, there's only like five or six people that do well under pure capitalism. And there are more than five or six people. Until Mark Zuckerberg's army kills the four other people who are doing well under capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now then there's, there's just one person who's doing well under capitalism. <laughs> and Peter Thiel is and Peter Thiel is all seize the means of production. Democracy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. or worse development outcomes than countries with fewer resources. Close quote. You spoke recently at the National Conservatism Conference in Miami, I think, about the resource curse. Oh, I wonder what Peter Thiel's after party. Oh man, there was hella coke at his after party. California. <laughs> He's like, I'm in Miami, if bitch. You say that uh, tech is the oil of the of the 21st century um there is this strange juxtaposition where california has been you know, it, it has these gusher like companies that just generate you know enormous wealth enormous profits you know a decent number of quite well paying jobs and then they're combined with this um you know rather bad form of social political governance uh where you you'd never do anything anything like this and wait what it's, it's dude, california's economy is bigger than fucking like france dude like what the fuck <laughs> what the, like like say what you this california is like a fiercely capitalist place yes i believe uh our economy i think now is like the fifth largest in the world and we're close to the fourth we're not i forget what other country we might overtake soon let me see juxtaposition 50 largest economies in the sense. world There's like a san francisco version of it where this is only you know, on country gdp it has to be one of the wealthiest cities in the world and then it's it's completely it's misgoverned and somehow uh, these things are it's not a paradox but these these things are actually deeply deeply connected so you what is he talking about like yes yeah, san francisco's rich and it's also a city and it fucking runs like a city it runs like an american city in a liberal state god what the fuck is this take made the point but i would, I would the, yeah the one thing i would quibble with on the definition is um california is not 
poor. It's 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 still fantastic. It's in, you know it's 40 million people in California. It's 82 million in Germany. 125 million in Japan. Today, the California GDP is roughly the same as Germany or Japan. The average person in California makes twice as much money as the average person in Germany. Three times All right, as much so as the average person in Japan. Three point thirty-seven trillion dollars gross state domestic or gross state product. Uh, right, but like the, the the exact like where it fits in is fifth in, largest in twenty twenty one. So like the like like where it fits in is like I think like not I, I don't I don't want to get in the weeds about this, but like. <clears throat> This is the, the California. I would suggest to you is the most capitalistic state in the United States, not not the least. Yes. Uh, but yeah, uh, it would rank in terms of nominal GDP as the world's fifth largest economy in 2021, behind Japan and Germany. And in terms of GDP in PPP, it's the tenth largest after Brazil and France. Additionally, California's Silicon Valley is home to some of the world's most valuable technology companies, including Apple, Alphabet, and NVIDIA. That's weird you put in NVIDIA. In total, over 10% of Fortune 1000 companies were based in California in 2018, the most of any state. There you go. Japan. So there's something about it that's, that's worked quite well from a macroeconomic point of view. And then it's worked catastrophically from a government. Yeah, you, you, yeah by capitalism, they mean, uh, he thinks it's not capitalist, least capitalistic. He means they tax him too much. But like capitalism, like taxes and capitalism are like inextricably linked. They're besties. You, capital, you need taxation and capitalism. You do, yes. Uh, without taxation... <laughs> uh, you know what we were talking about? How Walmart owns the roads. Walmart owns your house walmart owns you that's capitalism without taxation what do you read public schools that don't work you know um california's public schools rank like right in the middle of the pack i think they literally rank 24th or 25th like they weren't <laughs> fine yeah <clears throat> but like also like it's lack of money You know, all these sort of government worker rackets. You, you mentioned uh, two. Sort of you mentioned a couple. Of, I mean, it's worked quite well. It's worked historically well. There's never been any cr massive creation of wealth over for so much wealth in so short a time, as far as I. Well, if, if we evaluate it by GDP, it's still working quite well. Yes. If we evaluate it by the quality of government, you know, it's right. it's it's quite screwed up. I the the you know the. What the, the fuck does that, that mean? Right. That's a like okay. The GDP is sort of like kind of made up, right? But like there's there's that's factors. at least a quantifiable number. Yeah, there's factors that go into it, and we compare things by GDP. But the government is screwed up as just a fucking straight up an opinion, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, the like, quality of government. Like what? What does that even mean? What? How how quantifiable? Do we need GUs, government units? And I just I'm just telling you. I or just are we going to measure it in freedom units? I just feel like there's a lot of people in in a place like I don't know, let's say Arkansas, who would do just about anything to be able to live in California. Just like yeah. the, the quality of the government services you get, the opportunity here, like <clears throat> it's capitalism, baby. It's capitalism. As goes California, goes the whole country. Because we're just, we're too big to fail, but we're also not failing. So, like, <laughs> uh, but, uh, like, how, how would you measure the quality of the government in, in California? How would you measure the quality of any government? Like, that's a non-quantifiable thing to certain people. It does better than to other people. So maybe he means like, because he's rich and he really wants to get taxed a lot less, the government is bad quality to him. But like the people that those taxes go to help 
would completely disagree. And I'm sure he would disagree if he had started his company elsewhere and the people there weren't able to work at his company and there were no roads to his company. You know, the, the taxes help him too. Like, how does he not realize that? This guy became one of the world's richest men in San Francisco because of the largesse of city, county, and state government. Yep. Do you think that a lot of people who went to California, like University of California or California State Universities, weren't responsible in some part for this man's success? Oh, yeah. Like, he built his, well, I shouldn't say he, everyone else built his wealth on tax dollars. So, for him to to be complaining about the government taxing him too much, which is what we're assuming he's doing here, uh, is just so... <sighs> what what what's the word ungrateful and so ungrateful for the opportunity he was given and not for nothing this is one of the few people on the planet who could eradicate homelessness in california with uh with a check basically yep <clears throat> and you know i'm sure if you asked him about like what things he doesn't like about california one of them is going to be like all the homeless people on the street or whatever and it's like dude you could eradicate that problem mm-hmm analogy I used He'd probably get a Nobel Prize for doing it. It's not the worst. It's not the best. Listen, there's not a lot of things that would cause me to off myself, but Peter Thiel getting a Nobel Prize is like, you know, pretty high up on that list. <laughs> like, well, I, I think if he donated all the money to solve the homelessness problem in California, I think he should get a Nobel Prize. You know who else? Should, you know, if Mark Zuckerberg just turned off Facebook tomorrow, I'd give him the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> It's not as good as Norway. It's not as bad as Equatorial Guinea. Uh, I think you should think of it as roughly on par with Saudi Arabia. Huh? Saudi Arabia has a crazy, crazy Wahhabi ideology. California what? has uh, a woke ideology. You're a gay man. This is disgusting, actually. Now, he's a gay man who was able to live in San Francisco or the Bay Area and suffered a lot less discrimination than he would have suffered in other places. In fact, if he grew up if he tried to do business in the South, he would have been shut out by people who figured out he was gay. And now he's comparing California to Saudi Arabia. Get the fuck out of here. That's fucking disgusting. Yeah, Tim Cook, too. Tim Cook wouldn't have been able to rise. It, Tim, These men are of a certain age where if they were living anywhere but the Bay Area, maybe Los Angeles, maybe New York City they wouldn't have been able to climb the corporate ladder once people figured out they were gay. Yep. But you don't get to be as rich as he is without being an absolute fucking monster. Yeah, I feel like Tim Cook <clears throat> is far less of a monster, but also probably his net worth is like a couple percent of Peter Thiel's, right? It's not like he owns Apple. He's just the CEO. Yeah. No. Listen, to Saudi Arabia is roughly like uh, wokeism to California. You mentioned the what the fuck? He just said that California's wokeism is like Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia. This is a guy who benefited from what he's calling wokeism. This is one of the motherfuckers that fucking climbs the ladder and then pulls it up behind themselves. He didn't just pull it up. He's He's taking a bat and swinging at everyone else, climbing it as he's pulling it up. Well, he's turning the ladder into bats, actually. <laughs> yep, and then using it to swing at all the people trying to climb it up. Right. Yeah. He's pulling all the rungs off and turning them into like things that he turned them into nunchucks and shit. Right. With the. Yep. <laughs> like, what the <laughs> fuck, dude? Get the. Come on. Aspect of the misgovernance is inflated real estate values. Explain how that works. You have to think of it as uh, you have to think of uh, the curse of an oil state or a tech state. He's like, here's a problem you've helped create the inflated real estate values that maybe people like tech workers um, paid too much for their house to get people out of, out of the neighborhood.
uh, you, you have this enormous gusher of wealth, and then it gets redistributed very inefficiently. And, and one inefficient vehicle is towards overpaid government workers. The average California government worker gets paid twice as much as the average private sector worker in California. It's by far the highest ratio in the U.S. I mean, yeah, because okay, so it's that's... like it's such a lovely fucking job to work at the DMV. And the other thing is like. The, the California government doesn't operate a McDonald's. You know what I mean? Like the people who are making like minimum wage, those aren't the kinds of jobs that the state of California is providing, right? They're providing more, like it leans, it definitely heads more in towards the professional category. Yeah. Like usually you need some sort of financial degree. Right. Or whatever, whatever it is. And yeah, but let's let's all be mad at the DMV workers for making more than minimum wage. Right. Man, fuck working at the DMV. Jesus Christ. Florida, the average government worker gets paid 10, 15 percent more than the average private sector worker in California. It's twice as much, including, you know, including the very generous uh, retirement, retirement benefits, benefits right, they get. Right. And then the second way um, that the tech wealth gets very inefficiently redistributed is through. He's like, listen, you need to fuck people over. All right. All these How is that inefficiently laws, yeah. redistributing wealth? Paying people to do a job? How is pa that inefficient? Paying people well to do a job too, right? Like, what the fuck? What is wrong with this guy? Like, like how much of a fucking monster can you be? Like, those evil people at the DMV who get abused by, like, they, like, like, for my entire life, people have talked shit on the DMV right mm -hmm. and like so somebody who goes and works there like the people that are going to talk shit to them because it's just like the way it goes like that's just like part of our culture and it's like yeah the, the, oh no they're making more than the average person well i'm fucking fine whatever maybe the state government should pay people a living wage what the fuck where you know if, if you're living in san francisco or silicon valley you're not in the tech industry, but you know, you're a landlord lord who bought some apartment and you make sure the zoning laws never get changed, nothing new ever gets built, and you know, enormous amount gets uh gets uh, shifted into into the sort of you know very uh quasi-governmental real estate sector. Overall the cost of living in California is yeah, nothing high. new has ever been built in California. The cost of real estate is a hundred percent. Let me fucking higher. tell you, man. What does that mean? Once again, when I was younger, basically you have to replace exactly the same buildings all throughout San Diego County. They just move out. Sure. Like sure. stuff is fucking I, I constantly mean, getting built. There's construction the literally uh, down the street from me right now. The, new buildings are being built. New high density housing is being else. built. And, new uh, business and centers are being the built. Middle class constituency left in California. What the fuck is this dude on? If you think of teachers or people like that as not natural Republican voters, um, if that's the you know the microeconomic, the political economy of California is something like that, it's no wonder that it's a D plus thirty state. It's not. It, I mean, it shouldn't be surprising at all. Right. Um, so this brings us to politics. Y you argue that the Golden State poses a problem for each of the two parties, Democrats and Republicans. Democrats first, quoting you. On the Democratic side, my read is that they have all no, they, the Democrats, have no alternative but to somehow pretend they can make the California model work for the country as a whole, but it won't. It's just like, you know, if you, you, you were to do a quote of himself, back to the Saudi Arabia analogy, if you were to you say, did, yes, the Wahhabism in Saudi Arabia, Arabia is, is the is the key to solving all the problems throughout the Islamic world. They just need to be like Saudi Arabia. That's what the, the fuck? Office. Like, why does he it's keep comparing? I feel like the you know, those edgy atheists who used to tell me as a gay person that if I didn't hate Muslims, that, that I was wrong because they'd throw me off a building in Saudi Arabia. I feel like I'm going to make one of those arguments here and I'm going to get clipped and people are going to get mad at me. But motherfucker, <laughs> like California is not Saudi Arabia because like you are a people knew you were gay before Gawker published about it. Everybody knew you were gay and you were allowed to fucking climb the ladder that you're now turned into nunchucks to hit poor people with. But also Saudi Arabia is not democratic and California is <laughs> like the, the Democrat. The Democratic Party would be like. The Democratic Party would be outlawed in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, but I mean, like, the, like 
the elections we have in California work very well for the Democrats because the Democrats tend to run the state really fucking well. People do well under the Democrats in California. And I mean, you know, as a nation, in the nation as a whole, people tend to do better under Democrats. Uh, not everyone. Like, there are certainly people who, certain people who do better under Republicans. But in general, the people of the United States, mostly the working class of the United States, do better under Democrats than Republicans. This is <clears throat> this is just amazing. I thought this is going to be boring, and I haven't I haven't been this fired about fired up about anything in a while. What a massive piece of shit Peter Thiel is! Like, oh my yep. god, yeah, well, holy shit! No way. wonder he's good buddies with Eric Weinstein. Bill money, and in a similar way, if you know, if California, if it, if it's if it's somebody like I don't know Newsom or Kamala Harris saying that it's some you know hyper woke identity politics, political correctness to the nth degree that's not what makes quick give me more right-wing buzzwords i fucking need them i just want to inject them right into my vein you know, you so not for nothing this guy participated in a thing at stanford university a couple weeks ago where one of the speakers dropped the n-word oh geez they were not going to allow any press in <clears throat> but they eventually like allowed people to sign up to get like press credentials to watch remotely and one of the speakers at the event that he was part of at Stanford, like, just dropped the N-word. Why did Stanford have that? <clears throat> um, That's what a lot of people were asking afterward, actually. Because Stanford, you know, it's like a it's like a rich like a rich boys club and shit. But it's, you know, it's in Palo Alto. It's it's, you know, they're not ver not very N-wordy place. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they shouldn't be. <laughs> right. Oh. scale them by a factor of eight to the country as a whole so it, it doesn't scale uh, you know what though if the event called national conservatism that he went to i bet nobody there dropped the n-bomb i'm <clears throat> like i don't i don't agree with conservatives i don't agree with a lot of their stuff but most of them don't just fucking casually drop the n-word as you just don't be, most people don't do it doesn't matter most people don't do it it's unpredicted as we speak you've got joe biden Kamala Harris, Gavin Newsom, quoting Peter Thiel, California is strong enough to crush everybody else in the Democratic Party. You're assuming that Joe Biden won't run? Mm -hmm. Right. California is strong enough to crush everybody else in the Democratic Party, which means you've got two Californians on top, Kamala Harris and Gavin Newsom. But one in 10 but people in the country lives in California. <laughs> That's not that crazy, right? That the top yep. two people below the president who might run for president next time are from... Like, that's that's not like... They're both Dave's neighbors. Okay, that would be weird, right? <laughs> they both just live on the street here that I live on. That's weird. But the, the, there's 40 million people here. Uh, if you if you flip a coin, you get heads. You flip, flip it again, get heads. Flip it again, get heads. That has about the same odds as picking someone random out of the United States and them living in California. Yeah. Not strong enough to be a very compelling agenda for the country as a whole. Yeah, you've just articulated my whole argument. I don't much, don't but, much the, but that's 10% that, right? of the I population think, yeah, lives I, here I, and there's 50 that. states. Like, what the fuck? Well, <laughs> well, I think the alternatives to California, if we were to enumerate them, it is, it is something like, um, okay, it is um, Elizabeth Warren. You know, the university, the crazed university professor. What, she's crazed? Like, you know, is like a bad Puritan minister from the 17th century. What? That's not going to work. It is, um, you know, it's Tim Ryan, the, fla the fake blue collar guy from Ohio, where, where no you, one cares this about This guy calling people. anybody a fake blue collar guy is just disgusting. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> this guy's never dirtied his hands at work in his life. Also, like, w what beef does he have with Elizabeth Warren? <clears throat> yo oh she wants to regulate silicon valley oh okay yeah that makes sense then <laughs> but like why does it like this guy she wants to regulate silicon valley and he's an absolute monster if i had 120 of, the, of this guy's money you know what i'd be doing right now 
you you probably wouldn't be doing this. I'd be hiring somebody to polish my gold toilet <laughs> and shutting the fuck up. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Like for fuck's sake, yeah, I'd be I'd be causing I'd be causing problems that Hunter Biden only dreams of causing if I was worth one twentieth of what this guy is worth. <laughs> like imagine like imagine having this much money and power and then just going out there and like doing this. I feel like rich people like him, you know, people that that didn't start out rich but they they got rich through you know, something they did. They just have this this notion that I got rich solely because of me. Therefore, I'm the best and I I know all the things and everyone should listen to me because I'm so smart and you know, look at look at how big my brain is and how wrinkly it is. And it's just not true. Like most people who get that rich, they get rich mostly because of luck. Right. Like a few good decisions and a whole lot of luck. Right. And I mean, <clears throat> like whatever, that that's actually fine, but I feel like I feel like if that's the case for you, you should acknowledge it and be like, I'm mm-hmm. so fortunate. Like the amount of good fortune that I've had. You can still be like, hey, you know, I made some of the right decisions. You know, I founded PayPal. PayPal is like a staple of the U.S. economy now. I, you know, we did a good job there. But like, I was lucky to have even been in the position to found PayPal. Like, like just a little, just a some small acknowledgement. Yep. Workers. So the, there's a Midwestern thing that's not going to work. There's probably you know some kind of crazed socialist thing a la bernie sanders or aoc it is That's 10 o'clock p.m and i think i'm gonna have to and, uh, head so, out yes, soon there's somehow there's some how long is this video california 100 years is, is uh, there's another 20 oh my minutes. god we're like so will, halfway through in the democratic party and then my speculative predictions when you, when you get to the country as a whole it will be found shockingly wanting probably well let me let me give my last little uh my last little diatribe about this guy yeah, let me bring you up full screen if you don't mind. Start yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, you know, much much like how Elon Musk thought he would come into Twitter and he would just be able to instantly run it because, you know, Elon Musk, he knows how to run everything and he knows how to do everything and he's a little baby genius, wrinkly brain, big boy. Uh and that is clearly not the case. Like the guy has no fucking idea how to run a tech company. And Peter Thiel, I feel like is exactly the same kind of guy. You know, he feels like he knows exactly how to run a state, but if you gave him control of California, he would drive it into the ground just as fast as Elon is driving Twitter into the ground. And that's that's why I feel like it is so dangerous to let people get that rich to to allow someone to just keep hoarding wealth, just keep amassing more and more wealth because you get to the point where someone can can make these these huge uh, like societal effects can with their wealth. They can just toss their money around and impact society in these drastic ways that have ramifications that'll probably last for decades if not centuries and it's it seems crazy that we as a society have decided like yeah all that amount of power should be in one guy yeah let's let's give that amount of power to just one guy and, and not for nothing it's With always no a, vetting not for too. nothing it's it's always a guy and he always sort of shares some of a Peter Thiel's um, physical characteristics, let's say. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, with like zero vetting too. Cause there's no, like you don't have to be a good person to make billions of dollars. In fact, you have to be a bad person to make billions of dollars. You can't make billions of dollars if you're a good person. Well, Cause maybe that's you not a good thing to billions. do. So if you you're wouldn't a good person, do it. If you're a good person, if you had that kind of money flowing in, you wouldn't keep it. You wouldn't keep it, and also you wouldn't do the things necessary to make that kind of money flow in. Like you would just pay your workers, right? 
Right. You'd be like, well, we're doing really well. Let's go worker co-op here. I'm my house in my house in Miami and my house in LA. We good. And that's like, that's like yeah. 10 or $12 million net worth for you to have like a nice house in Miami and a nice house in LA. And this guy's got like thousands of times that. Yeah. So, you know, the, he gives off the exact same vibe as Elon Musk. And he talks about California as if like, you know, he knows exactly how to run it and he would turn it into the greatest thing ever. And it's exactly the same bullshit that Elon was spreading about Twitter. And we all can see right now exactly how fucking well that's going. Right. People's Mastodon servers are crashing because of how well Elon <laughs> Musk is managing Twitter. <laughs> like, Yeah. And, and Elon's like, oh, Twitter feels alive right now. It's like, yeah, that's because everyone's coming to see the show. Right. <laughs> like, right. this if- is a train wreck. You are doing a train wreck right now, and people are watching. Right. It's That's like, it's, the thing. It's a conflation. It's the conflation of, I just got in a horrific car wreck, and everyone's looking at me. I must be a celebrity. Yep. <laughs> no, people are rubbernecking because we're you know bad (laughs) yeah (laughs) we want to see the show everyone loves a train wreck yeah it's it's funny that we haven't done any peter Thiel on this show because you and me in different ways have been involved in the world that he's created um unfortunately i fucking i am of the age cohort where uh he was a bit of a known entity at parties um you're you're younger than that you're not gay either so uh, that that brings a little bit of uh you know changes things a little bit but this guy was a known entity at parties like um that Blake Masters guy who ran for um ran for a senate in Arizona was known as one of Teal's twinks at one point hmm and uh, wow. he hadn't blocked me on Twitter yet for calling him that <laughs> 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 but like but yeah the the and and I know you're trying to go, um, but the we're living in this guy's world in some ways, and it's only like the largesse of the state of California and the city of San Francisco that has prevented us from fully living in this guy's world, and that's why he doesn't like the state of California. Yep, he didn't like government yeah, so- because it is the only thing powerful enough to stop him. Yeah, so if you need any more proof that this guy's an absolute piece of shit. So yeah, um I wouldn't even use him as toilet paper. So maybe before before you go, I I don't like well, I think a wealth tax is fucking like probably necessary, but it's like shit and masturbation. I think we need a wealth cap. You know yeah, how, like, on a video game, uh, how once you get 999 coins, you just can't collect <laughs> anymore? I think we need to implement yep. that as policy. I think, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about this before. I think it should be, like, the amount of tax you pay should basically be uh, a function that approaches 100% with every additional dollar you earn. So, like, you know, for your... For your first dollar, it's not taxed at all, or it's taxed at like you know a millionth of a penny, which right, right, an amount that it's impossible to, to pay all. because how because of how impossible it is to take a millionth of a penny. Yeah, yeah, it rounds to nothing at all. But by like your your hundred thousandth dollar, you're paying it like you know twenty percent or something. You know that that hundred thousandth dollar is taxed at twenty percent. No, and every and me, dollar and, above it me, is taxed you, a little less. You and me disagree. But now every on, dollar after it is taxed a little more. And by like the logarithmic billionth dollar, too, like, right? Not linear, but logarithmic. Yeah, it it very quickly approaches a hundred percent. Not not logarithmic, but I think cubic or exp- is how it would be exponential. Uh, like it starts off at uh, if I can get my my graph right uh nope that's wrong okay this way so it it starts off very you were right close the first to time the... because you're like mirrored yep. in some ways anyway <laughs> let's it let's let's get concerned let's get concerned actually with zero. left which 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 way is the correct way on the x-axis <laughs> let's let's isn't it great that we're having this conversation wait a second no that is wrong this is right <laughs> 
<laughs> Aren't you glad yeah, we're able okay. to have so, deep and, and deep conversations <laughs> like this? Like, where else could people find this conversation? <laughs> it sure right. is good that we haven't been deplatformed yet. <laughs> so it it starts off very close to zero, and then as it's going up, it it increases. Like these are these are every dollar. So like out of the whole dollar, which is the entire graph, no, we know your first dollar is. is only taxed this much. Your second dollar is taxed this much. And then keeps going up until like your hundred thousandth dollar is taxed at like twenty percent. And then by the time you get to like your two hundred thousandth dollar, that's taxed at like fifty percent. And then your three hundred thousandth dollar is like eighty percent. And by the time you're at like your millionth dollar, it's very close to a hundred percent. It's like ninety nine point nine percent. And by your billionth dollar, it's like ninety nine point nine 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 percent. At your billionth dollar, I'd go one hundred seven percent. <laughs> and just start confiscating the dollars you made before actually like like, like really i i uh, but that's a wealth well, tax i i do think that people should always be able to earn more because if you don't do that then the people who just get off on earning more they'll start getting off on killing people or something because okay. you know they're monsters i, I, I thought you were so, like it bre- I, you're like we have to breed innovation by letting people you're like no those people will just go on a, a killing spree actually yeah they're <laughs> fucking monsters they're gonna kill people if you don't let them get more wealthy so like you can always get more wealthy it's just you got to earn like another billion dollars to get one more dollar out of it <laughs> Like it's it's funny, but it's actually not funny because like you just think about like what it costs to live a good life, like a really good life, right? Like think about like mm-hmm. let's say I live in San Jose. My yearly income for me, like after taxes, for me to live a really good life here, really good, like vacations, fucking a nice car, a house that I paid cash for, that kind of stuff. We're looking at three fifty a year, right? Maybe yeah. four hundred, yeah. Re- like after taxes, really good life. Mm-hmm. And so, like, and I mean, not everybody is going to live the really good life. But as soon as somebody starts gets into that realm where they can just live the best fucking life ever, yeah, just fucking take all their money after that because, like, what the fuck do they need it for <laughs> other than to do shady things and use their money to inflict to inflict their will on society? That is what people will do. Yeah. And we shouldn't be at the whims of the guy who's monstrous enough to take advantage of everyone around him. And like it's always a guy. A and he always looks a little, he's always a guy and he always looks like Peter Thiel. Yep. Like, look at what money. So, did yeah. to J- like, look at what money did to JK Rowling for fuck's sake. God yeah. damn. Yeah. She even tells people, well, I'm rich. I don't care what you say. And now, as soon as you start doing that, now let's now we'll go into the 104% tax bracket. As soon as you're like, I'm rich, I don't care what you say. Up, oh, fucking, you know what? You've exceeded 100%. We're taking, we're actually, t- <laughs> you didn't make any money this year. We're actually taking 80 grand from you. <laughs> yeah. I think that, that should be the, uh, the tax discredit. And it's, no, wait, there's a word for that the tax debit. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> It's like we have to do something and like we can't we can't like I know there's a lot of communists in the chat who would like a guillotine, but I just can't get on board with that one. I think it's against Twitch's terms of service, but two, I don't want to kill Peter Thiel. I just want to take all of his money and like give it to like a give it to like a drag queen. Give it to all the drag queens. Yeah, give it to redistribute Peter Thiel's money to anyone who's ever done a drag queen story hour. There you go. I'm fully on board with this idea. Not all of his money. He can keep like $10 million. Imagine how sad he would be if he woke up tomorrow morning and his net worth was only $10 million. He would be like crying into his 70 million thread count pillow. Yeah. And imagine how fucking happy the rest of us would be if we woke up in that situation. Yeah. So like it's, it's there's, there's... <laughs> happy guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> bagels that that I rate lump there's something going on there that I probably can't co-sign just with like some of the uh just like New York City and bagels and stuff I will maybe we'll maybe we'll maybe we should workshop that and think of a better thing to say there <laughs> that's the cutest guillotine I've ever seen it's adorable whose guillotine is this lucid <laughs> lucid who 
Uh, Lucid Owo. Thermal Knight. <laughs> it's from Lucid Fox. Who's Lucid Fox? Can we get Lucid Fox? I need a new co Oh, shit. HK's still here. Um, <laughs> I'm going to follow whoever. I'm following this person. Fuck it. Whoever, whoever has the happy guillotine. It's so cute. It's so cute. It's got like the little W mouth, too. It's that so is, cute. Yeah, the Owo. It's the Owo mouth. <laughs> I just follow I'm Lucid also Fox. Fall. Can can we get a shout I'm out to Lucid Fox them. in the the chat? I don't know anything about what they're doing, but their their guillotine is adorable, and Twitch hasn't even yep. removed it. Follow. I'm following. How do I get rid of this screen? Do I have to? I'm just gonna hit Control R on my. Yo, browser. that's a that's a pretty nice uh, uh, profile picture they've got. Is he cute? Is he hot? Is he single? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Uh, his profile picture is pretty hot, but it is a, a drawing. And mm. I tend to find drawings of guys more hot than the actual guys. <laughs> oh, not me, but I guess that's a big difference between you and me. Aren't you glad that we've had this intense uh, conversation? <laughs> HK, thank you for joining me tonight. I, I wish we would have done you for Peter Thiel me. earlier, but I feel like maybe right now with Elon having taken over Twitter and just like and with you having like left LinkedIn to start your own company and to try to do uh, an entrepreneur, maybe, maybe we needed to grow as I uh, shut none of this. None of this is starting to sound like a fucking head talk. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. It's Peter a Thiel. good time to introduce Peter Thiel to the mix. It is a good time. I, I, I feel like we would have done a much poorer job had we introduced Peter Thiel to the mix in like episode 47 or whatever. Yep. Uh, we should put this out, by the way. This uh, this Peter Thiel. I thing. agree. Yeah, like I yeah, I don't know what kind out. of title we were allowed to give it that won't get us kicked off of uh, Apple Podcasts, but we need to find a. Uh, um, we are allowed to say I I would assume we'd be totally fine to say Peter Thiel is an absolute fucking monster. I would take the word "fucking" out. Peter Thiel is a monster. I would just put that. Okay. Out. Yeah. And not yeah, for nothing, not for nothing, uh, friends of ours, uh, Guru's Pod, uh, one of them hit me up about three weeks ago to ask what I knew about Peter Thiel. And I said, how, how much time do you have? <laughs> how much time do you have? But we're like, the problem with those guys is one of them's in Australia and the other one's from Ireland and in Japan. And I feel like you having not grown up here, but having spent I think most of your adult life was here in Silicon Valley, right? A big portion of it. Yeah. And then me having grown up here and like, I think that like we're uniquely positioned to kind of talk about this guy and, uh, not, not for nothing, not for nothing. If you want to hit me up tomorrow, I, I got a, I got a couple of Peter Thiel stories that I am terrified to say on air because he is a litigious motherfucker. I think it was most of my life, most of my adult life. Because if you count adult at 18, yeah. I lived there for nine years. Yeah. And I've lived outside of there for only seven years. Eight years? Eight years. Well, you're older than I so, thought yeah, you were. It was most of my adult life. I thought you were like 30. <laughs> I'm 35. I just turned 35. I didn't even wish you a happy birthday, but that's because they kicked you off of Facebook for stealing their umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows my birthday anymore, and that's perfect as a 35-year-old. <laughs> happy belated bra. Oh, the chat here loves you. Thank they, you. They loves you. <laughs> anyway, HK, Thank thanks, you, chat. Thanks, for, thanks for joining me on this. I, f I also think we need to find... Um, oh, you know what we can do soon? We got a couple things we got to do. One, we got to go look at that Mark Zuckerberg, Kara Swisher thing again. Okay, yeah. Or maybe instead of that, there's a newer one. It's audio only, we can do it. But also, we got to go to the episode one of The Portal, where Eric had Peter Thiel on. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I would love that. Yes, let's do that. All right, thanks for joining me, HK. We will suffer through the Thank rest you. of this tonight. Um, you know what's <laughs> fucked up about the intellectual Dollar Tree, by the way, just real quick, is that huh. like the best moments of this show never go out on the podcast. They just don't. <laughs> yeah we always have like the these big uh big good discussions after the show but i'm glad you put them out you know on the like the patreon or or whatever or i mean if anybody knows how to use twitch 
Yeah. Oh, we're putting video out on <laughs> Patreon now too. Oh, cool. They get the whole video capture. Uh, and as soon as I start running out. out of space, uh, some of those old links won't work, but it says so in the Patreon. It's <laughs> like, Hey, you know, hosting isn't free. Video files are big. <laughs> anyway, Twitch. What's that? Oh no. Peter Thiel. Hell I'm out at Twitch. Cause he just fucking invent it <laughs> <laughs> or pay for it. Good night. HK. Good night. Bye chat. Public inside is that they'll think it's good enough to say simply that they're not California. This nihilistic negation is probably not enough. Well, let's qualify that again. And this is speculating on 2024 right. politics, which is quite which is far fun. in the future. It's, it's so far, far, it's so future, far in the future. It's Peter Thiel should run. So far okay, in the future. But, uh, but I think, uh, I think it, is, it is probably, if it's not enough for the Democrats, it is probably enough for the Republicans to win. Um, the, elect, the presidential election in 2024, I would like them to do more. I would like them to, um, to win on substantive grounds where you don't just have a, you know, a tactical win. You don't just have another one-term president. Um, but, uh, but what does that mean? Is not win on tactical grounds? You know, we're not going to allow this. It's, he calls him the, the leader of the rebel happen. alliance. This yeah. guy is not the, listen, if we're doing star Wars, this guy is like, this guy is like maybe not Darth Vader, but he's like, He's like that emperor guy, right? And, uh, maybe that's enough. But I, I, I would like more. But I'm, I'm, I'm not even completely questioning the, the, okay. the, the tactical judgment. So let, let, let's talk for a second, if we could, about what that more should be. Here, when I was in college, let me take you. Let me take you on a little travel log here. When I was in college, we were worried about getting jobs, and there were bull sessions in the dorm rooms about the Soviet Union, about how Vietnam went wrong, and so forth. Ronald Reagan gets along and gets elected in 1980, and both problems get solved. An economic expansion begins, and it takes place, takes, continues for, with a few setbacks, but it fundamentally continues for 25 years. And we win the Cold War. And so for my generation... But that didn't happen under Reagan. There's, a, I think, a perfectly understandable impulse to say, wait a minute, why don't we try that again? But well, for we can't. generation... Ross Dowlett has this phrase that he keeps using, zombie Reaganism. So I hear that and I say, of course, principles have to be adapted to the issues of the day, but is there an extent to which the rising generation on the right and center right is just sick of hearing about Ronald Reagan, the way Democrats in the 60s got sick of hearing about FDR? Is it purely generational? Nobody ever got sick of hearing about FDR. FDR had some problems, cuts, but I ain't sick about hearing no FD, about no FDR. Somehow are ill-fitted to the circumstances <clears throat> of the day. Well, I, I, th I think I, I would like to get back to growth, um, and I would like Wait, to get what? back to growth that is, you know, not um, inflationary, that's not cancerous, uh, and that's not uh, you know apocalyptic in the sort of bad tech version and. This is this is much easier said than done, but that's that's what I think. You know, we should figure out. I don't even know what you do, said. How to do this in a, in a detailed way? And there certainly is there probably are some tax cuts that are part of it. There's a lot of de deregulation that's that's part of it, um, and it is a it's a fairly hard thing to do. There's um, you know there certainly are ways that I would like us to take the uh, the challenge of China more seriously. Uh, but it's it's not like this this super simple thing. You know, there was there's a way that the Soviet Union was motivational in a way that China was not, because the Soviet Union, even in the darkest hours, the Cold War, 79, the Carter Malays, um, most of us thought we were eventually going to beat the Soviet Union. And uh, the China piece, it's, 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 it's harder to see how to do that. It's, it's not entirely up, up to us. Part of it What's up, you know, uh, up, depends up, on Oh, it's not even that late. I'm working just with tired. us, part of it, part of it uh, will be helped by you know, China just uh, going completely berserk internally wait what um, and uh no no authoritarian regimes are known for not going berserk internally we'll because people get okay, so people we'll get dead first what we know how to do but look look I'm, I'm i'm quite open i don't i don't know i don't know exactly what you're supposed to do in terms of having a more there goes more a concrete whole segment. agenda i thought you were gonna I th I, no i think i, well, in, I, I would say enjoy I, your day I, off but no, uh, stay to, here look i think those are mutually you know, always, exclusive by the way you know the uh the 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 right broadly is uh, it's a very ragtag rebel alliance. It's like uh, it's like we have diversity on our side. It is like 
it's like Star Wars, it's Chewbacca and Princess Leia, and we have you know some Asperger-like C-3PO people. The Rebel Alliance. And Han Solo, it's the, whole, it's the Rebel Alliance, and you know the other side is in lockstep, they're the Imperial Stormtroopers, and uh, there are a lot of disadvantages to the Rebel Alliance, but uh, one, one advantage is we, yeah, we don't, have, we don't have to have all the answers right now. We can admit we haven't figured it out. And we're going we're gonna to have a vigorous debate in the next few years to figure it out. We're talking a couple of weeks before the election. This will air a day or two after the election. May I ask? Wait, you, why, you did you, why, why did you take so long to air your fucking it. interview? Now run oh, yikes. In oh, they could have picked a... <sighs> I don't know why they picked that picture of him. Oh, there's like a famous person that he kind of looks like in that picture. Who is the famous, like, I mean, I know Blake Masters is kind of famous, but God damn. I can't figure out who he looks like in this picture. Maybe chat can help. I gave you a good information to start. I was like a famous person. The Joker, no. He's in the uncanny. He's not even, you you know what? That's that's the main reason uh, Blake Masters lost his election is that he's not even real. By the time this airs, we'll know the outcome. And J.D. Vance now running for the Senate. From Vance Ohio. won. By the that time sucks. this airs, we'll know. Why those two? Is there? Uh, you know them. They're friends. That's one element. I'm. Of, of, I assume. But was there I mean, but Teal didn't have a crush on J.D. Vance about uh, do, do they look to you like the future in some specific way um, that the republican party are absolutely like william defoe that's right that's exactly who that see i knew the fucking chat would yep i knew y'all would come through for me i just don't like i don't know the names of celebrities and shit instead i know the names of chemtrail people about to pursue sure there's a generational component they would be the first they would be the first uh, uh millennial republican senators there's a there's a way in which they've thought very deeply about these issues uh, there's a way in which I think they're not excessively dogmatic. You know, I, I often, I often wait. J D. Vance is not excessively dogmatic. Get the fuck out of here. Have, you know, often say, like to say, we have two parties in this country. There's the evil party, the Democrats, and the stupid party, the Republicans. And I, I like both uh, um, J D. Vance and Blake Masters because they don't squarely fit into either of those two parties. Right. Except that they're Republicans. here, just to pursue that. What what is to be done and take it up to it's a, the opposite of raising the roof. What he's doing now, he's trying to like tamp one or, down one or two party. conceptual notches up. Two quotations: Notre Dame political scientist Patrick Deneen, quote: "Liberalism has failed." He's speaking here of classical liberalism, the liberalism of individual liberty. Liberalism has failed, not because it fell short, but because it was true to itself. It has failed because it has succeeded. The founders failed to foresee that their atomistic philosophy would act as a solvent on our civic institutions. That's quotation one. Here's quotation two. Author George Will. The proper question for conservatives, what do you seek to conserve? The proper answer? We seek to conserve the American founding. Like, get the fuck out of here. Like, I don't want to hear any of this shit. Oh, I, I think things were great when this country was founded. Well, were you black? Were you a woman? were you gay in this founding? Like, who were you? Because it probably wasn't actually great for most people. It was great for a certain kind of people. The fucking, the fucking moneyed land holding gentry is who it was perfect for. Like the founding of every other fucking country. What's supposed to happen after that is that the, the American experiment to the extent that it has succeeded has broadened who can be a fucking giant asshole and fuck other people over, right? Like, I know that's fucked up. It's like that 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 thing where it's like, oh, you know, uh, <clears throat> we've done so much better. Now the person firing you for no reason might be gay. You know, <laughs> it's like, now the person foreclosing on your house might be a black lady. You know, <laughs> we've done so much better. Like, that's all, but... Come on, the founding was so bad that 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 no black lady was ever foreclosing on you because she wasn't allowed to. Like things have gotten better in fucked up ways, but like, come on, George Will. Let's get back to the founding principles, Patrick Deneen. Which let's principles? Let's overturn the original founding. 
they both strike me as too, um, a little bit too abstract. You know, there's, there's things about them that sound correct as observations or critiques, but um, how to concretize it, I, I don't know how we go back to the founding. If there's going to be a new founding, that's even more, you know, ambitious. And like you, this, you, oh, more ambitious, you say. If we had a new founding, Peter Thiel, you wouldn't like it very much. Six conservatives on, or originalists on the Supreme Court? Um, sure, but mostly they're just, they're mostly just keeping things the status quo the way it is. So, so it's, uh, yeah, it's better than the alternative. Um, look, look, I mean, what's the alternative? Right, that in some sense, classical liberalism has failed. I, I always like to say that a classical liberal in 2022 is like a Marxist prof in 1982, where you have these profs who were 40 years ago were saying, you know, true communism has never been tried. And uh, it's equally wrong when the classical liberals in 2022 say that true liberalism has never been tried and there's some- But you're not a liberal. Today, um, golden age we- Like I'm a liberal, this guy's not a liberal. Did. Wouldn't we just cycle and repeat it? Like would, people and, are here like, yep. despite the fact that I'm a liberal, there's probably a few conservative people around here like, I don't know about this, but most of y'all are like socialists and communists and shit. I'm a liberal, Peter Thiel isn't. Peter Thiel's a conservative. And it's a fine thing to be a conservative, I suppose. Like, it's okay to be a conservative. <laughs> like, my dad is a conservative. But he's not, like, he's not, like, voting for Republicans anymore. He's a classical conservative. <laughs> like, a nice man who cares about his family and doesn't think women are stupid or doesn't hate poor people and shit. Like, what the fuck? Like, this guy's, this guy's a conservative. And you might be right. This guy might be like, I don't, I don't say this. I, Peter Thiel might be a fascist. Yeah. He, he may be, he's like Richard Spencer with a giant bank account in a lot of ways. And if we went back to the fifties, we'd get 68 again. And, uh, and so there was something wrong in the fifties or there was something wrong with the founding. If it, if it there was something wrong, there was something wrong in the fifties, Peter Thiel. Like if you and me would have been in love in the fifties, we wouldn't have been able to get married. We wouldn't have been even able to tell anybody that we were in love. Like Peter Thiel, there was something wrong with the 50s. There's something wrong now. In 1968, yeah, he mentioned, he said, oh, if you do the 50s now, you get the 1968. He means the, the fucking, he means the Civil Rights Act. Oh, yeah, Peter Thiel's gay. And being gay is a fine thing to be. The, some of my, oh, wait, no, I'm just gay more on the Deneen side than the George Will. No, uh, Lisa, if you have a minute, if you're not, if you're not doing something else and kind of lurking and listening, check out, um, look up Peter, just Google Peter Thiel and Gawker. Um, I, I do think, uh, 69 viewers. Nice. You know, the, the, the place I always come back to is I, I think we have to think very hard about these questions of technology and science, um, because they are such, such, such big, big drivers of modernity. I don't think we can turn our back on them. We have, but we have to figure out some way uh, to keep going on this trajectory, um, and and not to go. Some of my crazy, best friends are, you know, straight. The whole society, not not to self destruct it. But I don't I don't think you can go back on science and technology. But that's the that's the uh, gamergate's complicated astro. I, I would ask a lot more about, and where I, I suspect both Deneen and, and Will are are weak on the details. Okay, um, February nineteen forty six. Diplomat George Kennan, then stationed in Moscow, sends a telegram of some 5,000 words to the State Department, known in history ever since as the Long Telegram. There we are. This guy, like, how do you sell, how, how do you send somebody a 47 page telegram or whatever? Like, what the Kennan fuck? Gets everything. I couldn't even write like a 40, 48 page novella if my life depended on it. How do you send a telegram? the fucking state department that's 48 pages or whatever or however many it was in like the right after world war ii like man you know what that person cray everybody who ever did a fucking facebook live vertical video from their truck needs to pay homage to the dude who sent a fucking dozens of pages of telegram to somebody my god thousand words the nature of the Soviet Union, where it's strong, where it's weak, and then he lays out the policy of containment. A lot of the Groypers are kind of problematic woods, though. The fundamental American know. policy, 
Some presidents are truer to it, others attempt to depart from it, but it remains the fundamental policy for all four and a half decades of the Cold War. Why hasn't there been a long telegram about China? Uh, well, because we don't use the telegram now. People do a video from the fucking front seat of their truck. Why questions are always so hard to answer? Uh, but but I when will there I, be a I, will, I, will, I will I will speculate that if it hasn't if we haven't gotten the memo, it's been lost or it's it's not going to be c coming anytime soon. Uh, and my my theory on why there hasn't been one and there, the there Google guy wrote a the Google memo guy wrote a memo. What are you talking about? That's the same thing, right? One is that. Um, is that people don't what happen to the Google memo guy? What a failure to grip strategy for the U S of how do you, you know, how do you accelerate things? How do you overtake China? They don't know how to fill out the details. You know, maybe, maybe setting China aside, maybe, maybe, you know, a correct broad strategy for the U S is, um, is to have a gradual, you know, withdrawal from, from the world. And, uh, and you could never articulate that if that's the correct strategy, because the retreat becomes a rout. And so if the correct strategy is for the U.S. not to be overextended, overcommitted to the sort of uh, world empire that we're, we're committed to, um, articulating, you can't actually articulate that ever. Hard to pursue a policy when you can't talk about it to each other. And then if you can't talk about it, that's, that's maybe even worse. So it's, uh, but I, 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 th I think there's, I, I think my, my, my placeholder is that uh, there's something about the, the best policy um, that if it's articulated, the articulation itself will stop us from, from executing it properly. And may, maybe there's some way to, to contain China and, um, and, and probably, um, you know, we're, we're best just figuring out a way to do it without articulating it. All right. Um. I heard you the other Has day. Has Behind the Bastards done a Peter Thiel episode yet? I feel like I feel like Robert Evans be leaving a lot on the table if he hasn't done a Peter Thiel episode. By the way, Robert Evans, if you're out there and you'd like to do an episode on Peter Thiel, I would love to help you. You said that we now find ourselves between Scylla and Charybdis. Narrow Greek mythology, narrow straight. Scylla is a six-headed monster over here, and Charybdis is the whirlpool over here, and the Greek, in Greek myth, you had to navigate between these two, each of which was deadly. Oh, let's not get into the, like, Scylla. a nerd, like, come on, everybody. Here's what happened. Gamergate. Y'all are talking about Gamergate. A bunch of nerds that are shitty people didn't like that women were doing video game shit. Like, it doesn't matter what you're what your tribe is there's shitty people in your tribe so like if you're a nerd or if you're on the dystopia beat there's shitty people on the dystopia beat like if you're a dj if you're and if you're a fucking rapper a guitarist a fucking vocalist there's just shit people in your fucking tribe that's it there's nothing you can do about it well i mean there's something you can do about it we learn a little bit from punk rock in the 1980s with what you do about if people get extra shitty, but you know. And actually, and you, here's what you said in a recent paper that you wrote. The stable deterrence structures of the Cold War look much shakier as more countries acquire nuclear weapons. It seems far easier now than at any time since World War II to sleepwalk into an all out conflict. So the prospect of Armageddon, let's call Good it. Good evening, Tracy. We're and here's Charybdis. <clears throat> this one's one where you may want to go back and look at the VOD. Because this Peter Thiel video we've been watching is actually terrifying. An endless stagnation. And quoting from the same paper, we have grown attached to our soft... I love how the, like the, like the ladies in more or less my age cohort and a little older around here are just like... Y'all are just like this in my chat. I love it. How bad, uh, of, of course, what I have in mind is the war in Ukraine. How bad is the, pro is the Scylla, the prospect of Armageddon? Um, well, the, the thing that I would say that's always nuanced and complicated is that it's, it's, it's quite bad, but uh, we have to also weight it against the alternative. And yes. the extreme alternative is is the sort of soft totalitarianism 
a, a society that's con that simply is locked down where nothing happens. Um, you know, if you were to use the, you know, the, um, you know, the, 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 the biblical terminology, it's, it's the Antichrist, the one world totalitarian state. And um, oh, you love that they're in the church. He's talking about the Antichrist. At least What's up, Stark Raving. Been a minute. Antichrist as of as of Armageddon, and uh, and, 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 and then and then certainly my my contrarian intuition is that people are far more worried about Armageddon than they are worried about the one world state. And uh, I would I would at least like us to worry about them equally. To worry both about Scylla and Charybdis. Okay, so. Elaborate a little bit. Uh, well, well, I, 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 there are all these different versions. Of it. There's, right. you know, there was a recent paper by. The, by the, uh, the, uh, just the Armageddon. How much did that table cost? The well, the, the way Armageddon is, we pursue science and we pursue technology, and it could all blow up in a nuclear and then, war. And then let's, yeah, let's let's right. elaborate on this. Yes. So if you if you don't pursue, if, if if we're going to stop that, you can't just stop it locally. You have to stop it globally. You have to make sure what? that all scientists stop it. You have to make sure that they're being policed all over the world. And if there's some small piece of computer code that can r lead to a runaway AGI, we need to have surveillance technology installed on every <laughs> single laptop to make sure that people aren't typing in keystrokes to code up the AGI that's going to destroy the world. Or if you can, you know, um, you know the nuclear weapons issue already from the 50s and 60s, what came with you know, this multinational at atomic energy agency that was going to, international at atomic energy agency that was going to sort of monitor um, all these countries, and you needed a supranational uh, structure with real teeth. And uh, you know, in practice, we ended up with something in between. We ended up with you know, some kind of global super state. It wasn't never quite that much. It was not, maybe not quite enough to fully stop Armageddon. It what? was never quite global enough to Global super state. But those have been those have been the uh, the bad alternatives for for 77 years, and uh, we need to find some way in between. Okay, and the lockdown. Yeah, the, uh, we fear Armageddon too much. There was no lockdown. We only talk about yeah. We, it, it strikes me we almost only talk about the Armageddon stuff, and we we, we never talk about the uh, the, um, the the sort of regulatory political. Uh, lockdown. That's that's the uh, the practical alternative where everyone, yeah, everyone's just scared of their own shadow. So if we put it, I'm, try, I'm trying to bring growth back into this. Growth to pursue growth means, in one way or another, to have the courage to risk a certain degree of new innovation. We uh, we unleash technology and science again to produce growth. Correct. Yes. All right. So, and yeah. why do we? You and I, uh, because we have known each other a long time and think alike in some pretty basic ways. We both say we both hate assume uh, other gay good. people. But, well, let's make that explicit. Why do we need growth? What does that do for American society? And what, why is the American what happens or the other way around? What happens to us in the absence of growth? Well, um, we had, you know, the club, the club of Rome uh, wrote this book called the, the club for growth, growth. 1972, 1972, almost exactly 50 years ago. And um, and it basically said that you know, um, the growth couldn't continue, and so we had to get used to a zero growth world. First a world of zero population growth, then a world of zero economic growth. And, but these things uh, aren't, haven't come to be. Like, what is he talking about? ...has been implemented over, over the last 50 years. And, um, and, you know, it has in some ways perhaps it's stabilized the world, but it's also been profoundly destabilizing um, to... Oh you know, shit! It's, it's led to a world that's extremely nihilistic. Um, it's it's led to the sort of um, so uh, <clears throat> hit bang enter enter in all caps and uh, that's that all over print shirt too. That's fucking rad. I don't know who uh, offered to give that away, but thank you, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I'll bring up. I'll bring it up real quick. This is a fucking rad fucking shirt. Hold on. What's this one? Look at that. A rad fucking shirt. A little bit loud, you know, just like us. Cultural disintegration of the middle class, where you think of the middle class as the people who think their, their children will do better than themselves. 
um, and and they're sort of all well, hit bang enter in the chat and maybe you can zero growth world hasn't worked out that well hmm. and uh, and so yeah so my and my intuition is that it's and you if you don't win you could buy one stable we don't make a ton of money on the merch it's not by the simply way. decadent or simply we make stable. like six bucks on um, the it's not simply entropic it's 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 ultimately you know there's ultimately a catastrophe on both sides so and there's a we don't, yeah there's a, there's an Armageddon catastrophe if you have unconstrained tech and science that where no one's paying attention and people are just pushing buttons and seeing what happens but there's also um, always a risk that giveaway of, feature by the way is dope that is the dopest thing uh, if any of you I don't know if there's any streamers watching uh, I have I'm a partner now with fourth wall so I have like invites and shit if you want like an invite so that you can they'll like even call you on zoom and shit and talk to you about um, talk to you about like what you're trying to do they're they're i was skeptical when i got their email but they're cool also not for nothing one of the one of the people on in that c-suite is a fan of this channel and that's the only reason i got that invite c-suite the they're all like 25 totalitarian catastrophe on the other on the other side which is uh, which is the natural solution on how do you you know how do you stop all science and tech is you need a one world state with real teeth how do you stop all science and tech? The, the new world order, the new world order will stop all science and technology. Not on Twitch. Uh, I'm a partner with Fourth Wall. We're not partnered here on Twitch. We never will be. Uh, I don't. I wouldn't accept their agreement. I don't. Their partner agreement sucks. The humanity's grass as AI emerges. Yeah, we're partnered with Fourth well, Wall. It's 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 it's, it's already it's an we answer. Get a little better split on the problem. shirts. It's an answer to the environmental challenges. It's an answer to the AI challenges, and I would I would just submit it's it's not a good answer. All right. So can, sticking with growth. The reverse thread. Well, that's actually great that the reverse thread that won that won that shirt because the reverse thread has rated us a couple times and has uh like helped us grow as a community. So fucking that's appropriate. And that shirt is rad. Let me know if you have any problem um, in the checkout process or whatever. I can, I can, I can email somebody tomorrow if you have any problems. Well, it's just for one more moment. If we were to close our, if I were to close my eyes and just listen to listen to the dulcet tones of Peter Thiel, the dulcet tones and get the fuck out of here. In twenty twenty four, what's different? What's different about a growing? What's different about the temper or mood of the country? Could we hope? That economic growth would soothe the bitterness of our politics? Is that what happens? Yes, economic growth is soothed the bitterness of our politics. I think, I think if you had growth that was non-inflationary, non-cancerous, non-apocalyptic, it would solve all our problems. If we had a fake world and that doesn't exist. It would. Now, you know, I, I don't know how realistic it is or how easy it is to get there, but, but certainly, um, you know, the extreme sort of Malthusian zero sumness of, of the stagnation. A lot of shit is zero sumness. I'm not sure it would fully evaporate, but, uh, you know, it would be it would be lessened significantly. And, and without growth, I, I he really I'm just asked him that the negative Jesus of this, where without growth, you're not going to solve the polarization. You're not going to so solve the nihilism, the anger, any of those things at all. OK, last question, although it'll take me a moment to set it up. Franklin Roosevelt, we have a rendezvous with destiny. John Kennedy, we will bear any burden, oppose any foe. Again and again and again in American history, we have found ourselves required to display courage as, a, as citizens and as a nation. What? Because it really has, it, the choice has been be courageous or lose. All right. George Kennan. Be courageous or lose? Of the Cold War. I mentioned Kennan a moment ago as the author of The Long Telegram. This is from a book he wrote early, early in the Cold War, 1953. The thoughtful observer of Russian-American relations will find no cause for complaint in the Kremlin's challenge. He will rather experience a certain gratitude to providence, which has made our entire security as a nation dependent on our pulling ourselves together and accepting the responsibilities of moral and political leadership that history plainly intended us to bear. Well, what do you think? Can there be in this, if this is the moment in which we find ourselves, there's Armageddon and there's stagnation and creeping world government. And we have 
Creeping yeah, world. This is fucking New World Order the conspiracy the shit. Fuck this shit right here. Fuck this. Is something ennobling about this. This may. This, this is like a sanitized version of like the anti anti Semitic New World Order conspiracy, right? That's what this is. There's no other way to explain this. Was it just uh, as a uh, <clears throat> Alex from um, Q Origins Project? So this is just this is just a. Uh, academic window dressing on a new world order conspiracy theory right because that's 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 all it be like what the fuck again well it's Can um, I feel adventurous well it is uh it is um certainly something like this frame is correct uh it matters what we do. It's 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 well. It's good job, the reverse thread. You didn't have a hard time courage, checking out. It should have been. It was easy, right? Agency, like getting choices checking out for the shirt really was easy. Matter. You just click the you link know, and put in your information. You know, I, I I don't think you know. Yes, Armageddon and the the world government are exclus exclusionary possibilities. They're not exhaustive. I do I do think there's some you know some narrow or you know not terribly broad way in between but it's it's but there's a way but there's a way and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, there's, there's a lot for us to do there yeah they want to know it's you here's what we do well i'm, I'm glad you won the shirt up oh. peter teal thank you shirt is oh that's the sam harris knowledge, shirt the hoover institution and fox oh, it's this golden girl under it peter robinson so bang enter to win uh the sam harris shirt let me show you real quick before we uh, move on to our next video